Why should people write their own engines? Why shouldn't they? And why is it the wrong question to ask as we're going to talk about today? I'm Chris Delion of Home Team Game Dev. This is a super common question people run into when they're starting out. Uh, we see it all over the spectrum of people talking about spending years writing their own engine, regretting the mistakes they made, at the same time other people kind of being deep in that line of thinking. And really, there's something really important hidden in there I want to get at today about there's a right way forward, and it's not really either of those. But at a high level, of course, what writing their own engine refers to, and I think most of you who watch my channel probably get the idea, but for anybody who's newer to this or happening upon this video from random outside links, writing your own engine basically just means coming up with your own framework for how files get loaded, how animations get played, how input gets handled, all these kind of things, instead of using some out-of-the-box approach, Unreal, Unity, or popular options, Godot is increasingly an option, Game Maker is a version of this, all kinds of different engines and frameworks that basically try to answer how to play an animation, how to handle a collision, how to, like I say, load level files, save player preferences, those kind of things, are the kind of stuff an engine does, rendering technologies, uh, audio buffer juggling, that kind of stuff, as opposed to some people really get lost in the weeds of for years writing their own, and there's pros and cons to it, and it's for some people too, it's also the right path, right? This is also not going to be a one-size-fits-all, everybody's life path should do it exactly this way, that's not how an industry that is as dovetailed as games is can work. But what tends to happen, right, is that people have either just personally a curiosity in how these things work. And so they want to know. They don't want to take for granted. They don't want the black box. They want to write their own. It kind of feels like it doesn't feel authentic unless they're doing some of these things by themselves. And so they go off on that path of writing their own engine. One of the things that also can happen, though, that I think we don't call enough attention to is in many ways, it's putting off, it's going to sound insulting, it's not meant to be, a harder question. And what I mean by this is that the biggest challenges in game development, and this has been true for decades, isn't how do you put an image on the screen, isn't how to play a sound effect, isn't how to load a file and save it safely. It's why you do those things, what you do with them, right? It's much harder to figure out how to do a good painting than it is to make a paintbrush. It's hard to play a song people want to hear. I mean, it's hard to make a violin, it's hard to make a trumpet, but those are a little better figured out than how to perform music that's novel, that's interesting, that that speaks to today's interest of people. And the same thing happens in game spaces where oftentimes, through one reason or another, the pathway in life that we've taken, if we just connect the dots going backwards that we feel set up to do, is we got a bit of an engineer's hat, we have a certain set of skills, engineering-oriented programming, more so than design fundamentals, more so than necessarily wanting to coordinate with other people, wanting to test with customers, deal with marketing, those kind of hassles. And so sometimes, what we've got to be watchful for is, are we actually hiding from those tougher questions? by saying, oh, I'm by putting them off, by saying, you know what, I'm not going to play music until I've built my own piano. That way, I don't have to think about it. I don't want to actually think about these game design questions about the players I'm serving and how and the, the complicated space where there's no perfect answers, when instead I can focus on how to eke a few more frames per second out of my shadow rendering or something like that. So sometimes that's what's happening, not always. There are also people who take that path, get very, very deep in it, and certainly find their niche in industry and in life or professionally of they are the world expert in doing this very narrow slice of a thing exceptionally well. Ultra optimized AI tricks, ultra robust networking solutions, uh, ultimately working for teams like Epic on Unreal Technology or working for Unity's engine development and so on at id Software on id Tech. And there's nothing wrong with those lines of work. That said, for many people, what actually draws us into games is precisely that we've played games that inspired us, that we like games, that we have ideas about games, that we want to express to the world our thoughts on games and that's where sometimes it's, again, unfortunately, pushing that problem, kicking the can down the road of really not touching that yet, not giving ourselves permission to struggle with those layers of issues until we first have made a whole engine. Now, one of the reasons why this becomes a big problematic black hole, I'm reminded of uh, one of the first people I was super like looked up to in industry. He was my development director when I was a Medal of Honor franchise 15 some odd years ago, uh, John Sawitz. Guy actually worked on one of like the three developers on Paperboy back in the arcades in the 80s. And these days he was the development director. And I, you know, I was scheduling time when I was at the big company to, to interview different people about what I could eke from their knowledge and make, took my notes. And one of the things he said to me that really stuck out was he said that throughout his career, whether it was 80s arcade games, whether it's contemporary cinematic, AAA, huge budget stuff, consistently a big factor has been trying to not do everything. That it's about figuring out what does this single game need? And actually being able to implement to that to an extent, which again, to our engineering mindset can sound like, hold on, are you talking about hard coding? Are you talking about special casing? Are you talking about not being able to have robust, reusable code? And sometimes, yeah. Sometimes that's what makes sure that your bosses that have special cases feel like a special experience. Sometimes it, what means that this item doesn't behave in the same way that every other item is just a parameter tune on essentially the same pattern. 
right? Sometimes that's what that means. It also means that when you're trying to solve every single use case, what's happening is you're avoiding, again, moving forward to these tougher issues where at any single point in a decision, you're saying, what if instead of making a decision, I just supported any possible decision? And you can see why this is problematic. Because again, it means no decisions are actually getting made. And if the goal is to produce a game, to produce an experience, to reach players as opposed to other developers, then it is really important to not try to do everything all at once. The other thing that happens is that uh, a lot of the problems with engines that people making as their first experience, even if they spend six years doing it, even if they finish an engine, in order for an engine to be useful to people, it needs to actually have been able to solve real use cases. It needs to have been tested against actually developing something with it, using it, putting it to, to purpose. And that without that, I mean, so look at like even Unreal Tech, obviously originally spawned out of Unreal, the game franchise before it became the engine as a separate product. Same thing for id tech, every layer of that. First, there was, well, you know, even older back, there's stuff before Wolfenstein. Most people know it as starting with Wolfenstein and then Doom and then Quake. Obviously, more recent versions of Doom and Quake engines have been used for other versions of things where they could generalize that out. And again, what they're reusing and reselling is how we load it and play our model animations, how we handle our lighting strategies, how we do our optimizations for level spaces, our tool set, our framework, uh, network technologies, and so on. But they had to have a real use case first. It wasn't something where they just sat down and had an open-ended, what if we could support absolutely anything in the world being made? Because that tends to just go, it spreads itself too thin. It avoids making things. It's also where even in the case of Unreal Tech, and granted now it's improved somewhat to four and they're already talking about the next version. But back in UE3 days, even at AAA scale, there were teams who were encountering and rediscovering that that was a set of technology, incredibly powerful, incredibly robust, incredibly top tier engineering talent in the world working on it at the UE3 era. And yet still, because that tech had been built around specific use cases of teams of a certain size, of certain genres of games, what they were finding was in many cases, it was a great fit for a first person shooter. It was a great fit for a third person shooter. As soon as you tried to do something very different with it, like a RTS style game, it was possible, it was doable, but it involved some more gymnastics. It involved some more getting in there, doing some rewiring, changing up stuff that was kind of deeply baked into assumptions about line of sight, camera perspective, movement, mechanics, physics, all these kind of things that have to operate very differently in structurally different spaces. And then conversely, those same teams, again, would also realize that internally they'd been for many decades producing RTS franchises that had certain advantages to how that information is structured and deals with in a way that's great for other RTS games that does not port naturally over into solving the exact same sets of questions with the same set of priorities to make an FPS or a flight sim or a puzzle game or any variety of other things. And so a use case can be important. Unity is a little bit of a weird one in this case, but even then Unity actually historically began as an engine being built for a very specific game. People were building a game first, the engine spawned out of it. And this is where people who are competently building their own engines, in most cases, are drawing from real cases of they have released games before, and essentially what became their engine evolved out of patterns that they started seeing where they kept rewriting or reusing or carrying forward certain sets of functions, certain solutions to common problems. Even maybe a decade, decade ago, uh, in the Flash game space, Adam Saltzman of Cannibalt popularized Flixel as an indie-friendly early framework, engine's almost not even the right word, more of a framework, a library of code, in which it handled the animation, the collision, the input, all kinds of other stuff. So you didn't have to, as the developer, you could focus on when, why, and how to draw an image, play a sound, take input, save a file, and so on. But again, that didn't sit. To, that didn't come from him sitting down thinking, step one, I want to write an engine. That came from, he had just hammered out game after game after game after game. And he found the intersection of where he kept generalizing the solutions so that his animation system could support different use cases, could support different formats, could support different needs, so that his input now was no longer just keyboard or mouse, but also supported joypad input or other types of input devices. And, you know, again, the nice thing about this too, as we kind of grow in more sophistication of our technology, it's also where for deployment purposes, at a practical level, part of what used to have to happen in games back before the web, back before cross-browser compatibility, back before we built off of things like Unity or Unreal to cross-compile platforms, even to take a game off of one computer and run it on another, took special code to support different sound card drivers, to support different basic graphics technology, even before graphics cards, to the point that when we talk about like the old open source code from Wolf 3D era from early id, again, a company that since has gone on sold engines as a major part of their business model, they basically couldn't even open source the parts that before had to be sold out to middleware companies to handle how to juggle the different types of MIDI playing sound file hardware pieces in there or sound cards, sound blasters and that kind of stuff. And so that's a piece where those problems have largely been able to be gone away. 
So even when we're writing our engines, we deal with less with those. We have some more middle layers to build upon, which is great. But we don't want to get lost too much in those weeds of where, in my own path, there were games I worked on earlier on in my career using C++ and assembly and native technologies, writing specifically to custom chipsets in a way that if I wanted to port that same game from, okay, well, it's working fine on PC, now we'll work on Mac. Nightmare scenario, trying to rewrite a bunch of stuff in a way that on a more modern platform, which doesn't mean an engine, it can just mean a middle, so like I use in many cases for our beginning people, JavaScript and browser, just because more often than not, I know it can sound like browser design is a mess. It's a broadly enough supported specification. You can often write a game that at least 98% of the time works just fine in the other major browsers. And you can catch those other 2% of the cases, you can fix it without too many changes. I actually know a guy whose uh, background was also in like deep assembly. He would literally use Unity when he was making mobile games, not even to use their component architecture, not even to drag and drop environments in Unity's level design space. But his entire scene was just a single game object floating in space with scripts attached to it. And then those scripts would handle all the rendering, all the input, all the sound, all the file loading, everything. Just programmed his game in a pile of scripts calling each other in Unity so that he could cross compile easily to browser, to Android, to iOS, etc. He used it as a middle way to get things out to different platforms. Now, another reason people sometimes get scared away from these engines is that they have a concern that it's expensive or it costs too much, etc. And these are cases where all of them are at least at the learner level, at the scale of you're just a person trying to figure this stuff out, are for all practical purposes, and I'm not a lawyer, but they are free. There are free tiers, there's beginner tiers, that until you're making over, I think, and then the bar keeps moving. So again, don't take this as gospel. Look it up today when you watch this video before you use the stuff. But the level tends to be like, unless you're making $100,000 a year plus out of what you're doing with the stuff, in many cases, they're like, yeah, they just want you to learn the software. And so it's absolutely a fine, safe place to be. And the other way these things work is that by the time you actually start paying for that, what you're paying it out of, and the same thing applies differently to Epic engines and so on, is such a modest amount that you can afford to pay it, you can afford to budget it, and until then, they don't ask a dime because they want you to learn it and use it. Another thing that also improves in the realm of if your goal is to make an engine is actually using other engines. So before I was doing native programming in C++ and assembly and stuff and moved up into ActionScript 3 and more recently JavaScript and C Sharp for Unity and all that, earlier on, I actually was also on the side of making my little retro DOS style arcade remake games. I was also using modding tools, which were much more common back in the 90s because the games are so terrible that your homebrew basement content would be at least as good as the ugly, muddy stuff in Quake or ultra pixelated stuff in Command and Conquer. That's not faulting those teams. The technology wasn't capable of more than that. So those were the constraints, right? It's like, who can draw a better car on Atari? Anybody, because it's going to look like the exact same car versus a model today animated by someone who went to grad school for animation. Tough to match. But tangent aside, my point there is that when you're using tools like Bethesda's software creation kit, when you're using tools like level design tools that id software use, when you're heck, using Unreal or Unity, etc. You're getting familiarized with patterns and tools that reflect a lot of industry knowledge accumulated over decades of certain patterns and ways of doing things in order to smooth out that workflow, which can help inform. So when you build an engine, if your goal is to build an engine, you'll do a much better job of it. So again, to build an engine well, if your goal is actually to build an engine, it helps not only to have built other games that don't necessarily use an engine, but to find the patterns, and then also to literally get your hands into some other engines to look at what they're doing, not to copy them, but to try to take notes on, this embodies a certain set of knowledge. They have gone down many different paths and there's reasons why they are. And it doesn't mean that you can't be better. It doesn't mean you can't do different. It does mean pay attention because there's reasons why these two have certainly dominated the space and the scales that they do. Unreal with the big AAA side, predominantly in Unity, especially at the small to medium sized company, solo indie student scale. The other side of not using an engine. And this is where, again, it might sound like I'm really egging towards like, oh, you know, use an engine, build off this stuff, worry about these problems. Uh, one of the major things I figured out as a private trainer in game development and then working through with hundreds of people through my different organizations I've run is this problem where if somebody only has ever used an engine, they've only ever existed at a layer of abstraction of using Unity or using Unreal, etc. You get this problem where they, they, they might be masters in that tool, but they lack the versatile foundation to A, see other ways to do things, or B, they start to conceptualize things in the way that the tool is structured. It doesn't mean that they're ruined. It doesn't mean they can't learn different. It doesn't mean that they're at like a lifelong disadvantage. But it does mean that many times you have to take a few steps backwards in order to build a better foundation. And that's where the approach that we teach, and it's why I've got my courses like codeyourfirstgame.com on Udemy that now a quarter of a million people went through or how to program games that 8,000 people have paid for or my textbook used by, I don't know, 200,000 people, whatever it is. Like these are things that really go back to say, okay, well, we're not going to quite worry about the old school actual assembly level era of like how to flip values and memory for the video card and all that and how to make a sound tone out of a computer. That stuff's archaic. That stuff's for the museum, that stuff's for the academics, nothing wrong with that, but it is. 
Instead, we say, but let's also not take for granted the way that Unity, Unreal, etc., are handling for us, how collisions work, how the passage of time works, which sounds really abstract, but is actually a super complicated issue about variable versus fixed frame rate, about the implications that has on the mathematics used for smoothing movements, for deceleration, for basic control curve stuff, which sounds bananas, but makes a huge difference in your game for the structuring of turns and collisions and sounds and all these kind of things. It's worthwhile to go back to do a version of those. And the reason I say a version of those, and again, this is in the context of making games with it. So, you know, you're actually solving real problems and not fooling yourself off in la la land of maybe someday this will come together and become something. Maybe someday someone will play this instrument. I'm constructing my garage window song to play it for. Instead, what happens is you get this lens into realizing when you're using Unity, when you're using Unreal, when you're using some other framework, Godot, Game Maker, etc., you can see a problem and you'll have more solutions at your hand because you certainly know how it's built into the engine and like the Unity way to do it, the Unreal way to do it, the Godot, the Game Maker way to do it. But you also can kind of see through the matrix and you can kind of see there's actually other ways to solve this problem. Sometimes they're simpler, sometimes they're more robust, sometimes they are more flexible, sometimes they help your game feel different, sometimes they help your game have a different style or aesthetic in terms of the, the way things locomote, animate, respond to each other and so on. Anyway, there's, there's probably some other way you could go in there and bend over backwards and force and twist and wrestle and rewrite parts of this engine to behave in the way that you would need it to replicate this other behavior. But that actually winds up being way more work and not an efficient use of the energy. And where this becomes important is as a game designer, one of the major things you often have to do is partly wear a bit of a producer hat and be looking at trade-offs of it's not just what's a good idea. It's also what's a good idea out of finite time, finite resources, finite schedule, finite skill sets on our team of there might be an idea that's a good idea if you can knock it out quickly. There might be a good idea if you can knock it out without a ton of bugs attached to it. As soon as it's going to take a ton of extra cycles, spend time, etc., and you're looking at, is it better to do this in this clumsy workaround way or knock out these three things we can do efficiently? You've got a different equation to work with. And so it's really valuable to have those additional concepts in your tool belt to be able to say, I can draw from these things I've done before, see some other ways to approach this problem. And it's not just like an, it's not just a conceptual thing of I want to have a richer understanding. It's a genuine practical benefit where people get more value out of these tools, engines, frameworks, libraries, if they've done some things building games before and without it, which again, for our layer of abstraction, we tend to use, I say JavaScript on HTML5 Canvas, a couple notes about that. Because most of our people are using it as a stepping stone towards C Sharp, because most of our people are using it for stepping stone towards other things, if not that, even C++, SFML, SDL, whatever it might be, Swift for that matter, uh, it's something where we don't really go deep on the JavaScript particulars. Our goal is not to teach JavaScript for its own purpose. We use JavaScript for a few reasons, right? One, it's uh, compatible out of the box in every major browser across every major operating system. So there's no barrier to entry there of like, oh, shoot, I only have a Chromebook. You can do it there too. It's not a matter of distribution. One of the challenges that when you compile native executables in 2020 and beyond, heck, it's been true for at least a decade, is that every piece of software in between tries to block that download. You know, the browser says, I don't recognize it's executable. Are you sure? The operating system says, I don't recognize it's executable. Are you sure? The zip file program sometimes leaves the thing in there, it conflicts or tries to fight you. The virus scanner tries to stop you. Everything along the way tries to say, are you sure? And occasionally, at least on a Mac, like you have to actually go into the admin panel, enter your password, manually click allow. Some people will do that, but you're also going to lose a huge percentage of your players to check that out versus if you can send them to a tab to try it, see if they like it and then leave you can reach way more players. And when you're starting out, that can be way more valuable. It's better for morale to see that you're hitting 100 to 1,000 times as many people. It's better for your feedback and learning because people are actually playing your game to give you feedback on it. It's better for a chance to be discovered in a way that when those things get to the eyeballs on Twitter, on different platforms online, on itch and so on, increases the odds of someone then finding their way back to you as a collaborator, as a potential business person, as a whatever it might be, you don't want to be off hiding in a corner with a native executable suspiciously distributed as a zip file with an exe in it. Not a good spot to be in in 2020 and beyond. Again, a lot of people, you lose them in that pipeline. It's part of why I use the JavaScript stuff. The other part is that JS is such a versatile language. There's so many different syntaxes and ways to use it. Really, what we do there, out of the half a dozen professional programming languages I've used in industry or dozen or more I've used as a hobbyist and student and otherwise, what I really did for the way I teach JS is I just find the intersection of the Venn diagram of Virtually every programming language used for games, and you're hard pressed to find uh, exceptions to this. They have variables, they have arrays, they have functions, they got if statements, they got while loops, they got for loops, that kind of thing. And once you have a firm handle on those in ways you can recombine those fundamentals to do all kinds of different purposes, that's enough to cover the level of complexity needed to get what I'm suggesting is the goal here, where the answer isn't should I make an engine? The answer isn't shouldn't, should I never make an engine? The answer is build some games without leaning entirely on an engine, 
which is not the same as building a game engine because you're not trying to generalize it. You're just having to roll your own a little bit. Get an image to display. Load a sound file. Play a sound file. For example, in a way we take for granted from game frameworks, etc. By default, most software wants to read a keyboard as if you're trying to type. If you want to treat it like buttons, like a game action controller, so that you can press a button and detect when the button's released and so on, you write an additional layer of code around that. It's good to get a little bit of experience doing that. Now, you don't need to go off in the deep end and reinvent the history of technology. So where I tend to draw the cutoff line is, you know, I also teach people retro remakes as a foundation. It's where my video courses start on Udemy. It's where my uh, approaches and home team encourage people to go first before they move to 3D. It's not a requirement, but it's a soft suggestion from what we've seen work for people by the droves. Instead, we focus on, okay, we're doing historical progression of games. We make something that looks kind of like Pong from the 70s, looks kind of like Breakout after that. Looks like a basic tile-based collision game after that, just like my video courses cover. And really, we can kind of get a little bit further along to about kind of SNES, Genesis, and history level complexity in terms of maybe some isometric gameplay, maybe some like nicer platforming with some like bigger characters and some more dynamic worlds and animations and stuff. But once we start breaking into 3D space, that's where I don't think it's an efficient use of your mental effort unless your life and path in life is that you choose to, you want to be the lighting expert writing code at Epic or for Unity or one of these kind of environments. That's where instead of trying to reinvent the PhD work that went into figuring out how to properly stretch textures on quads and handle lighting dynamically on the vertices and support shaders with all kinds of complex calculus involved and so on, instead it becomes fairly practical to like, nah, at that point we transition out of using JavaScript on browser canvas to make 2D retro, high impact, responsive, arcade style gameplay stuff into Unity where we immediately, A, solve several sets of problems. We're loading models trivially. We're loading all kinds of different image formats trivially. I used to have a book of different image formats I had to work from. And like I would find the chapter like PCX formatting, have to copy code out of there to load a PCX image format. That problem is long gone thanks to stuff like engines or even in JS, thanks to the browser offloading that for you, right? That's, you know, human beings still had to solve that problem. But that's where, again, at that point, you want to start thinking about, okay, well, I already got the gist, I got the concept. So now I want to focus on where and why this model should appear. When should it rotate? Why? What should it look at? When and why should the sound play? And when I throw into these questions where there's a better, deeper solution than to try to wrestle rigid body physics collisions into doing it, you can draw upon the same way you would have solved that problem in 2D space with retro stuff, without a framework, without an engine. And there's, I realize, a little bit of a framework obviously built into JavaScript, HTML5, Canvas. But again, that's a level of abstraction in which it's not handling your sprite sheets for you it is handling you not having to write how to load a JPEG, which is a weirdly gnarly bit of code, right? So instead of having to deal with that deeper layer of abstraction, you're at a level of abstraction where you're still having to deal with kind of the game programming questions, the game development concepts. And it ultimately, even if your goal in life isn't to be a game programmer, but is to be a game designer. Most of the designers I work with are really technical game designers where it's someone who their core driving force isn't that they're really interested in the plumbing under the engine hood. It's that first and foremost, they have game ideas they want to express. Their whole life, they felt inspired by these things. They want to tell those stories. They want to make things. They want to creatively try out stuff. And really, they program as a means to an end, right? They program because they don't want to have to be at the mercy of finding somebody else to pay a bunch of money to or have to argue and make compromises and beg to do the work for them. They want to be in the commander seat of being able to steer and navigate well enough to get it working on device, which doesn't necessarily mean it scales to a gazillion players. doesn't necessarily mean it's something going to ship in a AAA engine. But for the sake of being able, can I get my Gameplay stood up and working and running? Absolutely. That level of technical proficiency is really valuable even for a designer. Not a requirement for every designer. It's okay there are non-technical designers in the world who are focusing on level design or systems or other kinds of balancing and spreadsheets and stuff, other kinds of economies and things. Not a negative thing about that line of work. But for a lot of designers who I meet who come out of more of a spatial gameplay, action gameplay, interest, real-time kind of interactions, for those, it's really, really freeing as a designer to have enough of a technical background so like I say, be able to stand up the idea for a couple reasons. One, it avoids these ambiguities of we're trying to like draw on a whiteboard or describe to somebody else, here's what I mean. And then their version that they do isn't exactly what you said. And you're having to kind of like figure out how to navigate these conversations politely of like, can you make it more like this? Can you make it more like that? I know that's what it sounded like I said. You want to, if you can avoid those, it's nice. And the second part of that is precisely because part of what happens is as soon as you get it running on device, as a designer, you can really have this tight loop of realizing Heck, that's even exactly what I thought I wanted, but I still want to make changes to it. I still want to tweak. I still want to iterate. I still want to make changes because once I play with it, I realize it should feel a little different, should flow a little different. Something's missing here. Let me try a few different things out and really to to get all mad scientists with it when you are your own implementer enough 
to be able to rapidly prototype on it without, like, say, having to have an additional communications loop in there, to have to articulate it, to have to do the feedback thing, to have to wait for somebody else's time, to make them have that human communication layer. Teamwork's important, collaboration's important, but for core mechanics as a designer, it's just really freeing to have that particular level of technical fluency. So maybe that's also where when I'm talking about this approach and the kind of people I work with, that's often the right answer for these kind of people, at least. If what you want out of life is to be more of a technical game designer, someone whose core interest is in real-time gameplay systems, interactions, and those kind of things, player movement, how that stuff feels, camera movement, those kind of aspects of game development, as opposed to, you know, like I say, lighting optimizations, rendering optimizations, and so on. Uh, this is where, again, the approach might not be using an engine off the bat or writing your own engine off the bat, but instead make a few classic games without it, like I teach at codeyourfirstgame.com or my follow-up course there, How to Program Games, followed by, this is where, of course, Home Team Game Dev exists in large part, because part of what happens is after they made those processes, they made those games, and like I said, you might want to move yourself up from there. You can basically do those on your own with my video courses. Once you want to get deeper past that level, and I say things like isometric games, I say things like SNES-style platforms or Genesis-level technology, part of what happens is if you try to do these things alone, completely on your own, several things happen, right? It becomes a real long slog. We're looking at like a year plus to make something versus a few months with a team of other collaborators. It becomes lonely on that kind of time frame. The other part that happens, of course, when people are trying to break out of tutorial dependence, right? When you're starting out, you basically need to follow some recipes. The same thing would be true in a kitchen, same thing if you're doing music. You start making something, you want to first figure out, can I make something where I know what the outcome is supposed to be? This is supposed to look like this. It's supposed to work like that. That works for a little while when your processes can be finished in a few hours to a weekend to maybe a few weeks. After that, we start getting to more original space where, yeah, you want it to be kind of like Metroid. You want it to be kind of like Diablo or something, but with a twist. And you want to start trying your own stuff. What happens is as soon as you leave those rails of safety, the tutorials, you're at this constant anxiety of what if I can't figure it out? What if this thing I run into is going to tie me up for weeks? What if I get stuck on it? What if I don't know how to proceed, and then all my work I went at this point gets wasted. What if it just drags out? And then suddenly I got this extra scary of every time I start to run into problems, it gets, my anxiety starts building up. And I start feeling that fear of like, I don't actually know if this is going to be a one hour problem, a five hour problem, a one week problem, or if I'm going to be stuck on this for six months. One of the challenges of being a beginner in any space is having difficulty assessing from lack of perspective, from lack of prior experience, how hard certain problems are that you're up against. And that terror leaves some people out of it, which I hate because as someone who trains people who are getting game development, I want people to stick to it long enough to see the results that they wanted to get when they started making games. So that's why out of the things that we do in Home Team, things people misrepresent or misunderstand Home Team as either a pile of materials or as just a team matchmaking service of some kind. It really is much more than that. In addition to connecting people to these materials, it also connects people to each other as teams, but also it's why we have me and there's office hours in way below my typical hourly rate to be able to meet with our project leads, to be able to meet with our members. So they always have this confidence that even they're working on original projects that are more sophisticated than the tutorials that they followed that are more original, which is of course also great for their morale because they actually care about the outcome. They can't get or stay stuck because whenever they run into a wall, they can meet with me included with membership. And we just talk through, here's the problem you're on. Here's how we get you past it. Here's different ways forward and what the trade-offs are in those. We had this happen this morning where somebody had a question and I'm kind of like, Okay, well, obviously, I could just give you the answer, but then you're not going to learn as much there. How much of a tip do you want? How much of a hint or push in the right direction do you want? And basically, what we ran into there was he was like, all right, I know other games that we've done have solved this somewhere in their code bases. Can you point me to the general project that solved this and then let me find it? And that was a great compromise. Because, of course, out of the over 100 home team games started, I guess about 94, which are released. We've got a whole bunch in development right now in parallel. I was able to find one from our repo and be like, here, go check out the source, see how they did it. And it gave him a chance to kind of reverse engineer, follow these threads, figure out, look at that solution, adapt and wrangle it over to his. And this is again where the learning starts to really get richer is where you're solving real problems for real projects you care about that are original works. You're also not hitting this barrier if I get stuck. And that can include, right? Sometimes I know the way some people develop processes is that they're, they're trying to do their own thing without, either with an engine or without it, but they're trying to do their own thing, roll solutions as they go. And they're running a situation like, I need a turret. And it sounds like this generic issue. I need a vehicle. I need a whatever. And so their first reflex is to try to find the tutorial online that shows how to do that. But sure enough, that particular solution really doesn't match your space, doesn't match your implementation, and so much so that there's so much work to try to untangle that, rewire that, make it work, that you're at kind of a loss. And so specifically part of what people come to me for out of our use of office hours and home team is that they can't find something that's a good match for this problem or question they're running into. And I either custom build them an example solution or I help guide them to some right directions, or I point them in, here's some places to start, some ways to try. Another thing I'll also do with people, and it kind of goes back to the same framework idea of iteratively 
The simplest approach first is to get your retro games working, building up towards, like I say, SNES, Genesis era, up towards and shifting towards Unity, towards as you build into 3D, N64, PlayStation 1 era, and forward 3D styles of gameplay. Then part of what happens there too is that we will look at basically like what is the cheapest, laziest, hackiest, most shortcutty solution to it, which helps us visualize exactly how the pieces hang together. And then we can iteratively refactor off of that. There's another part of the learning process that gets missed if we try to go straight to an engine that we're already looking for like optimized general solutions. And quite often that kind of simplicity, that kind of reusability really spawns from the repetition, the patterns, the experience that comes from I've solved so many specific cases to see which edge cases are worth handling, which aren't, to see which features are worth dangling off of this and bloating the number of parameters it takes or potentially subtle performance trade-offs that we're making there and which aren't. It gives us a practical reference point for it to first do it the brutally straightforward fashion, iterate from it. And that's also a thing that comes out of this thing where rather than thinking of starting with an engine or trying to write your own engine, it's first build some games in a way that doesn't heavily leverage someone's out-of-box solutions. Yeah, another example we've used to describe this before, I've probably brought this up before because it's a common talking point I run into with people who have these kind of questions, is it's like just because we have a graphing calculator, right, doesn't mean that we just drop people off into Algebra 2 or Calculus and say, use the graphing calculator to solve the math. It's so important if you're going to have a life in mathematics that you have some idea how to do those things yourself, that you've done them on paper with pencil, that you can figure out what it's doing for you. You've graphed some lines, you've done some equation balancing, you've worked some things. That's what gives you the richer, deeper understanding to not be limited by whatever you can happen to do playing with those buttons. And for a lot of people, if they go straight into the engine environment, they're actually at a big disadvantage too, because basically they just know how to fiddle with those buttons. Or it's on the other side, right, where it's like the uh, trying to ride an engine. They are, again, working from no use cases to find an overlap in. Or the other case too, if someone's only, basically, sometimes they ask the wrong questions first. They say, okay, my objective is to learn this engine. My objective is to learn this tool. And you can think of it like if somebody was a writer, and instead of saying, I need to learn how to write a short story, I need to learn the creative process, I need to figure out, you know, what kind of stories to tell, how to develop my characters, how to, what kind of schemas people's brains process information in for different genres and stuff. Instead, they'd be asking, okay, I need to become an expert in Microsoft Word, right? Where are the menu options? What's under each tab? What's under each thing? How do I, where are all the different buttons and formats possible? And it's, it's not useless information, but it's the wrong information if someone's real focus is I want to become a good writer as opposed to an expert in Microsoft Word for its own sake. And so this is where many times it's useful to do some writing outside of and separate from these questions about where to get lost in that stuff. Oh, speaking of which, it's one of the reasons why we also like JavaScript as well for starting out. Precisely because, especially the way we use it in browser, we tend to keep it vanilla and so on for a variety of reasons, simplicity. And again, we don't actually want to roll in soft solutions because our focus there is not on what's going to make the flashiest game possible, but what long term is going to best prepare a developer for a lifetime, a career long success building up on strong foundations for this stuff. Then instead, one of this goes on is that we can actually use a plain text editor at first, move our way up to a slightly better programming favorite editor like Sublime Text or Notepad++ or one of these kind of options in that space, Atom, for example, where it has some advantages, it has a little bit of structuring, has a little bit of automatic indentation handling in a way it's programming friendly. It can help you highlight where the braces match, but it's not quite as heavy duty on the deep intricacies of something like Visual Studio's packages, which are incredibly powerful and should absolutely be used and are, should be leveraged. But if at the same time you're trying to learn the fundamentals of programming, you're also trying to figure out the fundamentals of your complex IDE. Heck, before I started teaching people the process and curriculum that I teach and have now for about 10 years in JavaScript on browser canvas, before that, I actually worked with some people and using the same kind of approach, the same sort of processes, the same sort of thinking and so on, but with C++. And we'd have people we'd lose in the first day or two of just difficulties getting their development environment figured out getting all the boxes checked in the right places, getting all the tabs to get into the project workspace set up, getting all the, the libraries recompiled or whatever the thing was they needed to import, getting all the stuff to fix together was a whole separate thing they had to figure out separate from where and why and how do I put an if statement somewhere? How do variables work? What do functions work? How, do, how and when and why do I have a thought process about what to comment? And we really want to tackle those projects, those kind of questions first and foremost. And then we can grow into later a more sophisticated, more powerful tool to leverage the advantages of working with bigger code bases, working with stronger autocomplete, working with all kinds of additional stuff, certainly for Unity, by all means, yeah, you need autocomplete because each function's got sometimes six or a dozen different versions of it to browse through. Use that stuff to see the access directly to documentation. But in JavaScript browser, it's great because it's forcing you to really internalize where I'm putting stuff, where my problems are. Ooh, and one more reason why it's also advantageous when we work before we go straight to the engine framework is that when somebody's working in 
Unity, Unreal, whatever. And there's different places that the functionality is being driven from. It's being driven from, heck, sometimes it's in the scene. Sometimes it's in some other component. Sometimes it's a checkbox somewhere. Sometimes it's they co- hooked up to the animator system, which is advanced ways to use well. And there's also all kinds of ways you can get lost and stuck in the muck with it. If you make a problem and your code isn't behaving as you expect, whether it's because you're getting an actual error from the console log or because the behavior is not working how it should, if your problem is in plain vanilla JavaScript for browser, you know with absolute confidence that you need to change your source code, that the code is where that problem lives. And this avoids you having this constant nagging feeling of like, oh, I can't tell, is the problem actually at Sam in Unity? Is my problem actually in the Unity C Sharp or is it actually instead buried off somewhere else that I miss checking a box? Is it under a certain tab? Heck, did I add a Collider 2D, but it needed a standard Collider? Is there something where the relationship between objects and the hierarchy is messing it up? These are valid questions and Unity is still powerful and still worth using and still an advantage. But you'll do way better in that space if first you built up some confidence by working on some projects where if there's a problem and when there's a problem, and of course, game development and programming in general is ultimately creating a constant flow of problems for yourself to solve. When you can have certainty that the problem you have is in your code and that you have to keep looking at the code, understand the code better, trace through the code, rework the code, rethink it, simplify it, etc. That's what trains you to have that confidence as a programmer. So when you go over into Unity and you're using C Sharp and you're writing scripts and you've got all this stuff hanging together, you can look at the code and be like, well, the problem in here and allows you to focus your attention then back on where did I miss that checkbox? Where did I put the wrong component? Where did I, where's that wrong in the hierarchy? Where's my animator system strung together in a way that's missing the use of the word triggers and the labels and the animation sequences and the data from the imported FBX file and so on. But anyway, that's it for the day. As always, again, hometeamgamedev.com is where we teach people in this approach. It's a structured approach. It's got this kind of curriculum. Uh, if nothing else, if you want to join us in home team, how to program games is my paid course. Codeyourfirstgame.com is the free course. And those cover the same sort of trajectory for learning that now a ton of people in the world have gone through whether or not you decide home team is a good fit for you. That's certainly the approach we've been using here. It's gotten success for hundreds of people, releasing a ton of games, bigger schedules. And anyway, that's why, again, when I say the solution is neither to write your own engine necessarily or to jump straight into using an engine, it's hidden in the middle. It's making some games that doesn't heavily lean on somebody else's solutions for input, for animation, for smoothing, for all these kind of different pieces of how the engine fits together, how sounds get played, how music gets looped and so on. As simple as that sounds, it gives you a deeper, better lens into how to leverage the power when you then move on past that point into Unity Unreal as you, again, my historical progression, move up from 70s to 80s into early 90s design, right around the time of maybe 93, 96, 1993, 1996 era of game design, that transition from Super Nintendo Genesis into N64 and PlayStation 1 era stuff. That's when we make the jump into Unity or if your path isn't with Home Team in Unreal or some other technology platform. That's it for today. Thank you for being here. Thanks for following along. Love having these chats. And uh, yeah, got more videos for you as always coming up.